Welcome, Mr. Solaim. Solaim, Your Excellency, we can hear you. Excellent. So everything is everything is well. Fine. We'll start in a one minute's time. And uh, welcome, Mr. Guru Murthy, who is also there. So good afternoon, sir. Uh, we're just okay. waiting for our colleague from Mongolia to also, but uh, we'll, he can come in. We will start in a minute, sir. Okay, I will mute myself, but just make sure that uh, everything is well. So right, good, sir. Good to hear. Yeah, good. Namaskar. Good afternoon and good morning wherever it is across the world. I'll give good evening to all of you. I welcome you all to this international seminar on independent India at 75 democratic traditions. Uh, at the outset, let me wish all of you on this day of International Day of Democracy, a very good democracy day for democracies around the world. It's a time for us to celebrate the fact that we have been democracies for so long and hopefully that the rest of the world will also follow our lead and become democratic soon. The UN says that this day provides an opportunity to review the state of democracy in the world. And when today we look at the world compared to what it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago, we find that the majority of the world is moving towards democracy. However flawed or however weak it may be, but there is still a trend towards democracy. Democracy is today the default setting, and except for a few outliers, most countries, most people demand democracy from their systems. And among all democracies, I am proud that India stands tall as the largest democracy in the world, and where democracy has thrived, despite the challenges that we faced when we became independent 75 years ago, when we faced as a newly independent country, an impoverished country, impoverished by colonization, a huge population, poor literacy, incredible amount of diversity of states, of ethnicity, of religion, of language, of caste, of living standard. So all this put together, the challenge that we faced, still thrived, thrived despite that. And despite many naysayers who were pessimistic about India's democracy, India continues to remain a vibrant and strong democracy where the people have regularly expressed the democratic rights freely and without hindrance. The magnitude of this task can be gauged from the fact that in the 2019 elections, which were held two years back, more than 900 million voters were eligible to vote. And we had a turnout of 67%, which means almost 600 million people voted in the elections. Now, there are no country in the world which has a population of more than 350 except one 350 million, except one country which is not a democratic country. And so essentially, you're looking at a magnitude which is huge. And just to give, put it in context, to hold the elections, we need about 11 to 12 million people to hold the elections. And if I'm correct, there are about 110 countries in the world which have a population less than 10 million. So even if we try to outsource our elections to another country, you would find very few countries which have the population to even send people to hold the elections in India. But on this note, I just want to say that uh, welcome to this uh, conference on democracy. I'm extremely happy to introduce 
Dr. Vinay Sahasabrude, who is not only the president of ICCR, but also a member of the Upper House of Parliament, the Rajya Sabha. In addition to this, he is also an erudite person and a scholar who has done considerable work on issues relating to democracy and governance. I would like to call Dr. Vinay Sahasabrude to deliver his welcome address. Dr. Sahasabrude. Thank you. Thank you, Director General Shri Dinesh Patnaik, our uh, Honorable Minister for External Affairs, Dr. S. Jai Shankar, who is virtually present amongst us. Also present here are uh, His Excellency Gonching Ganbold, who is uh, a very long standing friend of India, former Ambassador of Mongolia in India, Shri Swaminathan Guru Murthy a very well-known uh, journalist as well as legal advisor, Sri Julian Lesser, Member of Parliament from uh, Australia, uh, Mr. Eric Solheim, former Minister of Environment and International Development of Norway, who has uh, graciously taken out time and uh, joined us in this particular uh, brainstorming. Sri Swapan Das Gupta, Professor Werner Mensky, Stephen Harper, former Prime Minister of Canada, and all other dignitaries, excellencies, and friends of India. Let me at the outset welcome you all to this uh, one of its kind webinar on uh, democratic traditions in India. We are observing the International Day of Democracy, and I was told that also the Engineers' Day. So maybe this is a good occasion to reflect on how do we re-engineer the democratic setup with which we have been working all along. Let me also say that uh, the Democracy Day is an occasion to revisit the world of democracy and also to, re to reassess the democracies of the world. More than ever in the past, perhaps it is today, that when one thinks about democracy, it is not just about sustaining it. Any discussion about this institution has to address a fundamental question, are democracies delivering? If the constituency of the supporters of democracy is to be strengthened, one has to answer questions like, are democracies making any significant change in the lives of the people, especially when compared to nations when there is no democracy. Democracy all over the world appears to be passing through a critical period. On the face of it, as a system of government, it seems to be well entrenched. Unlike in the mid of the last century, people no longer debate whether a particular newly independent country can afford to be a democracy or not. In the year 2000, when East Timor became an independent country, no questions were raised about the suitability of democracy for this new nation. It is now taken for granted that people everywhere are in favor of democracy, almost as if humanity does not know an alternative to democracy. However, as we observe World Democracy Day and deliberate on traditions, I believe that democracies both old and new, will have to work hard on quality of deliberations, management of diversity, and mastering the art of deliverance. When I say quality of deliberations, I am actually referring to debates and discussions in parliaments and legislatures, in print, electronic, as well as social media, in discourses shaped by academia, civil society, and the world of arts, Unless we work over time to enhance the quality of discussions on all these platforms and in all these fora, in all these fields, commitment to democracy perhaps will be hard to evolve. The second aspect is managing diversities. D in democracy is in fact all about diversity. Today, when the global community is grappling with the challenges posed by terrorism and crass monopolist approach 
in social, spiritual, and cultural spheres, one cannot undermine the importance of equality and security in every way to every diverse earth. And lastly, it is about ability to deliver on the part of democracies. Even with wide theoretical acceptance, practical success, and also popular support, the question whether democracies can have really delivered continue to haunt humanity. Democracy is without doubt a way of life, but it can never be denied that it is, after all, first and foremost, a system of governance. The merits of democracy are and will have to be measured on the count of ability to govern effectively. Pipa Norris, a renowned political scientist at the Kennedy School of Government, has rightly argued that democratic responsiveness and state effectiveness have to go hand in hand for the very survival of democracy. She further says that while it is indisputable that institutions of democracy do prevent the abuse of state power, it doesn't mean that those elected to government will automatically have the capacity to implement effective public policies addressing social needs. Obviously, therefore, a merging of democracy and governance, particularly state capacity, is the only way to achieve developmental goals. When Prime Minister Narendra Modi, what Prime Minister Narendra Modi has done is exactly that. He has successfully blended the democratic traditions that are a part of the body politic of we all Indians, functioning of modern democratic institutions like parliament and the election commission, and the ever-growing aspirations of the people. This model perhaps could rightly be called as development democracy, and closer look at this may provide some valuable insights and, as, and guidance as well to struggling democracies of the world. It, I may appeal the community of researchers in democracy and democratic governance to work further on this idea of development democracy to make it more effective. The success of vibrant democracy in India perhaps lies in our journey from traditions of democracy to effective deliverance of democracy. With this, once again, I welcome you all and wish the deliberations every success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vinesha Zubadiji. Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, it reminds me of uh, uh, the simplest uh, definition of democracy, which is democracy is rule of the people. Of course, Abraham Lincoln then added on to it and said it's rule of the people, by the people, for the people. But essentially, at its basis, at its root, democracy is the rule of the people. The people rule. And where the people demand things from their government. And like Dr. Sahasrabhade said, it's only a good governance which can give in to people's demands, which can satisfy demands of a plural uh, nation like ours, with a diverse nation like ours, with multiple demands. So you need governance to be able to deliver democracy. Thank you, Dr. Sajibrude. Uh, we are extremely gratified and delighted that Dr. S. Jashankar, uh, Honorable Minister for External Affairs, is participating in this seminar. Um, he has uh, recorded his message, which we will play now. And I would request that his address be played immediately. Thank you. Namaskar. Dr. Vinay Sastrabuddhi, President ICCR. Uh, friends, uh, it is uh, appropriate uh, that the International Day of Democracy is commemorated with particular enthusiasm in the world's largest and most energetic democracy. After all, for India, Democracy was not just a choice we made in 1947, but a way of life well before that. Few societies can compare with the pluralism that has been our historical characteristic. Forms of ballots and of representative government have a long tradition in India. Some 2,500 years ago, the Lichave republics had developed a consultative and democratic process of governance. Similarly, 
the village panchayats with delegates gathering for a type of a local grand assembly was an established custom in the 10th century chola era indeed variations of community based exercises of rights and responsibilities and broad participation existed in many regions they speak of our inherent attributes of transparency diversity and pluralism contemporary india's sense of pride in its electoral democracy is visible we contrast the vigor and credibility of our systems with those who have rejected such exercises as much as those who practice it imperfectly the consciousness of the power of an individual's vote even among socially and economically underprivileged voters or perhaps more so among them is a statement of how precious and hard won hard earned this privilege uh, remains every 5 years a general election in india sets a new record for the world's largest such festival in 2019 900 million people were eligible to vote more than all other democracies combined two of every three voters actually made the effort to go to the polling station a contrast to the indifference in many other societies the quality and the morality of democracy however lies beyond just numbers it can be found in the transitioning of indian society to a deeper more culturally rooted and more authentic identity our democracy has both driven this process and in turn been enriched by it indeed a faithful reflection of society in its elected representatives is what gives any democracy real strength and that is what we see in india today democracy is not just incomplete without delivery this can even it affect its very credibility whether it is in providing access to toilets to electricity or to piped water or in the near universalization of bank accounts democratic means are now realizing democratic ends the equality of the vote must necessarily coexist with the equity of human dignity one is pointless without the other seen in that framework india's ongoing accomplishments are validating its democratic credentials a country's external outlook inevitably goes together with its internal values it is only to be expected that a nation and a people would be comfortable with others of a similar bent of mind it also encourages the like minded to work together on global issues this also explains the context of india's quest for a global commons governed by norms and rules for political and cultural arrangements that accommodate diversity and multipolarity and for trade infrastructure and connectivity projects determined by transparency sustainability and buy-in of host communities as india rises and its capacities and capabilities grow it will naturally contribute more to the world a civilizational state re-emerging on the world stage and draws on its heritage will obviously create its own imprint in a truly democratic world such an india will be more india rather than more west its developmental template and its embracing of wider responsibilities will draw even greater attention to the salience of its model as a full blooded member of the global south as a system that intersects so much with the west and as a polity with a flavor that is uniquely its own india's trajectory will surely influence the global journey remember that as india becomes ever more democratic democracy will also become ever more indian both in its sensibilities and in its texture the international day of democracy is the ideal occasion to discuss cherish and celebrate that symbiosis uh, i wish you all a very uh, productive deliberation
Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Jayashankar. Uh, it is true, India has a long tradition of democracy, and the fact that democracy cannot go without development, both go hand in hand, because development feeds into better democratic structures, and democracy helps in greater inclusive development. Uh, with that, uh, we come to a finish for the inaugural session. We will start the first session uh, in exactly one minute from now. Uh, so please stay tuned. Uh, in one minute, we will start the you know, first session. Thank you very much. Namaskar again. First session of this seminar, India, Indian Independence at 75 Democratic Traditions. Uh, the first session will look at the philosophy of Indian democratic traditions. Uh, we have a host of excellent panel speakers who will speak on different issues on this topic. Uh, I would like to say before we start that while democracy as we know it today has been prevalent in the world for the last 200 years, I mean, we're looking at 200 years ago after the American independence, around Magna Carta after that. India has witnessed democratic systems and traditions over centuries. Democratic values are embedded in the Indian, Indian society, and the people have always played a strong part in the governance of their regions and their areas. Even when monarchies reigned and kings were in power, their power was checked by assemblies and body of elders who in many cases had the power to even remove kings in India. Even when the king ruled at the village and regional level, most institutions were democratic in nature. Democratic values were therefore not a new concept, but had existed since a long time in India. The Rig Veda mentions Samiti and Sabha, which was a sovereign assembly, which is a Samiti, and an elite body of elders, which was the Sabha. So democracy, as you can see, goes back and is as old as India itself, as old as the Vedas. Today, we have an exciting panel of speakers from Australia, Nigeria, Cambodia, and of course, India. I would now like to introduce Mr. Julian Lisa, Member of Parliament from the New South Wales in Australia, a member of the Liberal Party since 1992. He has held various important political positions, including Vice President of the Liberal Party State Branch, he is currently the chair of the Australia-India Parliamentary Friendship Group. He is also author of a series of publications. I would now request Mr. Julian Lisa to kindly give his address. Namaskar. Ajme Hindi men bonne ka praas karunga. Australia se ap sab ka abinanda. ICCR ko danibad dena chatahun. Mira naam Julian Lisa hai. Me Barara Lok Sabha Shetri Kasan Sadhun. Me Parliamentary Friends of India Ka Ajaj Bihun. Aj Yahan Anna Mire Liye Summan O Kushika Vishahe. Good evening. I'd like to start by expressing my thanks to the Indian Council for Cultural Relations for putting together this important event to celebrate Indian democracy. I'm honoured to be joined by such eminent panellists today from all over the world. As Australia's Foreign Minister Maurice Payne said in her Indo-Pacific oration in Delhi on Friday, Australia and India at their heart are both ancient and modern countries and cultures. India's history extends far beyond its 75 years of independence, just as Australia's history stretches back tens of thousands of years, long before the formation of our modern nation. There's archaeological evidence of connections between India and Australia from more than 4,000 years ago. There was trade between our countries before either was independent, with the colony of New South Wales trading with Kolkata, and of course our troops fought side by side in both world wars to protect the freedoms that we continue to defend today. This long history of engagement and cooperation is now being formalised in foreign policy structures. Australia's strategic alignment with India is obvious. The comprehensive strategic partnership signed by Prime Ministers Modi and Morris last year, 
articulated our shared vision for a region that is open, free and rules-based. A vision that was further advanced over the weekend when my colleagues Foreign Minister Payne and the Defence Minister Peter Dutton mm -hmm. met with their counterparts, Dr Jaishenka and Rajnath Singh, for the inaugural Foreign and Defence Ministers 2 plus 2. But beyond the strategic alignment that increasingly characterises relations between India and Australia, we are joined by our shared commitment to democracy, which is the subject for our discussion today. We often think of democracy as an Athenian concept, but early forms of democracy have, an, have a history in ancient India too. Between the 6th and 4th century BC, there were Indian republics and monarchies that had limited the power of the ruler through an assembly. To be sure, differently constituted in each place, such assemblies were known as Ghana or Sagna, made decisions by votes. These polities wouldn't be regarded as democracies by modern standards, but it's also worth remembering that many Western constitutional monarchies developed in a similar fashion, with advisory councils and assemblies as the first step on the road to popular sovereignty through universal adult suffrage, which constitutes modern democracies today. And that was certainly the case in Australia. The shared democratic heritage of India and Australia bring our countries and our people together. Australians watched with heartfelt concern as India dealt with its second deadly wave of COVID earlier this year. And we responded by sending over planes full of ventilators and oxygen concentrators. Just as Indians did at the beginning of last year when Australia faced terrible bushfires, Indian citizens and communities raised funds and donated in support. And the fellow feeling for Australians I experienced firsthand in January 2020 when I was in Delhi. The last Indian and Australian general elections took place only five days apart in May 2019. It's not just the timing of our elections that was similar. India and Australia are very similar in the way we celebrate our elections. In Australia, we have a tradition called the democracy sausage, where voters and their families enjoy a barbecue at the polling place. This leads to a fun and inclusive atmosphere on election day. And in India, the rallies and road shows build the sense of excitement across the country. One of the things on my to-do list is to come to India for a general election, to see the passion of the debates, the carnival atmosphere of the rallies, and even the appearance of the Prime Minister by hologram is something I want to experience firsthand. In my view, democratic India will fast become the place political campaigners from all over the world will come and learn about new campaign techniques and technologies, as Indian technological sophistication and know-how from Bengaluru and Silicon Valley develops new methods of engaging voters. The 2019 elections also saw the re-elections of governments in both Australia and India. And building on the personal connections between Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Morrison has seen the deepening and strengthening of the relationship across all spheres over the last two and a half years. As democracies, India and Australia share key values like freedom and openness. These values are central to what makes our country successful. In a democracy, the government's democratic and foreign policy is subject to the check of regular, free and fair elections providing a constraint on how the democratic government will act, not only towards their own people, but in the international arena as well. This makes democracies more stable international actors than dictatorships. Our strong grounding in democratic values sees us come together to resolve disputes peacefully and is our foundational shared commitment to rules, norms and habits of cooperation, which are at the centre of our region's strategic culture. It's our democratic values that guide our engagement with the world. India and Australia, as well as our quad partners, the United States and Japan, and other partners around the region, share a democratic outlook that values open markets, pluralism and inclusivity. Our democratic values similarly see us work for the rule of law to ensure we don't see mighty's right tactics take hold in our region. When faced with disruptions across our region from transgressions of agreed rules, such as under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or undermining the norms that impact emerging technologies, we're able to work with partners. Thank you, Mr. Lisa. Uh, uh, that, was, that was wonderful. I like the idea of shared democratic heritage, just not shared democratic heritage, but also shared election dates. I mean, if we can have the same election dates, that is a wonderful thing. 
But what I liked what you said is about the celebration of democracy. It's it's democracy really matures when people celebrate democracy. It's not just an obligation, an obligation to vote or an obligation to go out there and vote, but a celebration which comes out of the very essence that it is part of your own traditions. When you go like you go to a festival and celebrate a festival, you celebrate democracy. That's the reason we see such huge turnouts, turnouts of more than 65, 67 percent, which was the last elections, but large turnouts, even in uh, national elections, state elections, municipal elections, everywhere, people go to vote like they go to enjoy a festival. And that is the beauty of Indian democracy, because it's steeped in the tradition of Indian culture right down to the villages. Uh, while Indian democratic traditions are, mm, uh, let me let me just, uh, the next speaker we have. Uh, uh, while Indian democratic traditions have been around for a long time, the leadership of our country after independence borrowed ideas from other countries while framing our constitution. And yet, at its heart, the constitution remains purely Indian, where fundamental rights were enshrined, but also fundamental duties of the citizen were also put in. This is something very typically Indian, where you put not just rights, but also duties of the citizen. It makes one wonder whether it was because we had such a great constitution that Indian democracy has thrived or because the people of India are democratic in the thinking and espouse democratic values that democracy has thrived in India. Whatever it is, India is probably, if I'm not wrong, the only country which became independent after Second World War, which has remained democratic right through. We have never witnessed military coups in India. Uh, on this note, our next speaker is Mr. Igosha Emmanuel Osage, Director General of the Nigeria Institute of International Affairs. Mr. Osage is an outstanding academician, Vice Chancellor of the Igbindo University. He's been the Vice Chancellor for the last 14 years. He's a fellow in many famous universities and visiting professor and chair at other universities. He has many publications on federalism, governance, and politics. I would like to request Mr. Osage to give his address. The people and the government of India uh, on this very momentous celebration of 75 years of democracy. India has the reputation of being the world's largest democracy and therefore the world recognizes that there's a lot to learn from the Indian experience. For Nigeria certainly, India provides in a sense the mirror of a future because of the very strong similarities and connections between the two countries. Let me say very upfront, you know, that those similarities date back to a shared colonial history. That colonial history has provided and produced the federal framework for India and Nigeria. And that federal framework was the British recipe if you like, its formula for holding together its colonies of large size with huge diversities. And I think Nigeria and India share a lot in that respect. For scholars of federalism, we always like to talk about the differentiation between aggregative federalism, which is the American model of formerly independent countries coming together to have a union, and these aggregative federal systems, which begin from unitary foundations and then get disaggregated, as it were, for purposes of federalism. That's something that Nigeria shares in common with India. And um, secondly, to have democracy in the midst of diversity. That is a huge, huge challenge. Um, I think that federalism has worked in very wonderful ways in both countries. Um, the major difference in Nigeria, and I like to put it in a very dramatic you know, form, is to ask the question, would Nigeria's democracy have been anywhere near what India has enjoyed if Nigeria did not have military intervention? So in a sense, um, from a methodolo methodological point of view, the, the major difference between Nigeria and India all things being equal and all other variables being held constant would be 
the military presence in Nigeria that India did not have. Now, I imagine that if the military didn't intervene in Nigeria, Nigeria would have progressed along the lines of what India uh, has done in all of these 75 years, going back to the days of independence and the emergence of a Congress party uh, as a one-party dominant regime in India for a long time, which um, students have debates over whether it was, you know, um, democratically um, compliant or not. But the point is that the foundations were laid and they have been very strong since then. One of the things that confronted India's democracy was the question of the party system. And I think almost from the beginning, the preference was a multi-party system. And that has sustained, you know, India's stability, you know, all of these years. The party system has also been some kind of intermediation between India's diversity and India's social and national cohesion. So in a sense, the parties have articulated those differences in a most democratically progressive manner. And that has made it possible for India to, I think, um, do very well in the area of political accommodation of difference. Um, in Nigeria, we look at the Indian situation, especially its multi-layer federalism and the Panchayati system, especially, that has uh, produced layers of local governance, um, you know, and that's, that's very uh, adaptive. We also know that India had issues of how to properly um, delineate the boundaries of its constituent states. Um, in 1965, in India, uh, there was a commission that was set up to look at the feasibility of uh, the ethno-linguistic criterion, you know, for uh, creating states. And I think that has continued to be um, top on the burner in, in that country, just as it has been in Nigeria. Um, I think that the economics of, you know, the political regimes uh, has also been very helpful in India. That's one of the lessons that I think that, you know, countries like Nigeria would have to learn. India has done very well um, emerging from um, largely agrarian circumstances to becoming an industrialized nation. And I think, you know, nothing demonstrates this better um, than the experience that the whole world has gone through under COVID-19 and how India has managed to, to cope with the exceeding challenges um, that the pandemic you know, has brought throughout the whole world. It is significant that at the point the United States of America itself had to rely on the pharmaceutical industry in India um, to see ways in which um, the, 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 the pandemic could be addressed. Altogether, I think that India has also become perhaps Nigeria's biggest trading partner, you know, for our oil exports. And, and that's very significant because, you know, as Nigeria and India open up, you know, on the trade platform, I'm sure that the country's learning, uh, even in the economic sector, would um, become, um, you know, even stronger and more extensive. I think, you know, what India has shown is that it is possible to democratically manage the challenges of huge populations, not just diversity. And it has done so because, you know, of its, of its uh, adapted technology, because of its innovative systems and so on. So in congratulating India at 75 years of democracy, um, from the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, um, we like to believe that there is sufficient room um, for the two countries to continue to work together. Uh, we have shared and common interests. I am sure that uh, as an Asian leader, which India is, and as an African leader, which Nigeria is, there is a lot that we can do to continue in the traditions of what the founding fathers of both India and Nigeria um, had done a long time ago. 
So congratulations, India, on 75 of your democracy. We wish you all the very best. And we, we, we pray that India would continue to lead the world as the largest democracy and remain a stable, united, prosperous country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Usage, for the kind words and the kind wishes. I agree with you that the multi-party system has been one of the strengths of Indian democracy. Uh, in fact, to give you some numbers, uh, we have currently 2,500 plus political parties which are registered with the Election Commission of India. Uh, and about 500 parties field candidates during national elections. The 2,500 parties are for the state elections and others. But having 2,500 political parties just serves uh, the multi-party system we have. I also agree with Mr. Osage when he talks about a shared colonial history and when he wonders if Nigeria would have done better uh, without the military rule in Nigeria. Uh, India's freedom struggle was unique. Unique not only because it used non-violence as a weapon, but that it involved all sections of society. It was truly a mass movement, highly inclusive and broad-based. The parliamentary democracy that we are today was based on the democratic structure that the British tried to implement while ruling India with an iron hand. But these democratic reforms that they did, did over the year, years were not out of some love for India or some largesse, but were born out of a response to the persistent demand for democratization by the Indian political leadership. We demanded that democracy, which is the life, way of life in India, should be reinstated in India, that Indians should be given the right to rule ourselves. And so our freedom fighters, which brought independence to India, were not guerrilla leaders or revolutionaries who were out to overthrow systems and create anarchy, but were actually democratically inclined individuals who brought in a democratic system within India. Our next speaker is a very well-known person in India, uh, Sri Swaminathan Gurumurthy, a well-known writer and a journalist, highly rated for his investigative writings a distinguished professor in economics, finance, and legal anthropology. Mr. Gurumurthy shows how strong dedicated individuals are required for an effective functioning of democracy, how individuals make a difference in the way democracies function. I would like to request Sri Gurumurthy to kindly address the seminar. I'm delighted to participate in this uh, extraordinary event. Because in the context of the world today, this is not a mere ritualistic celebration of democracy. There is something far more serious happening in the world. Today, the world of democracy is being challenged by the world of autocracy. More than 50% of the people in the world live under autocracy. Less than 50% of the people live under democracy. So there is a need for democracies to come together and this has been acknowledged by the G7 in the June meeting where for the first time they spoke of alliance of democracies despite the fact that the West has been grading democracies and saying this is liberal, this is semi-liberal, this is illiberal and this kind of gradations of democracies seem to be disappearing because there is a need for democratic nations to come together. Already the Freedom House has declared that uh, democracies are declining and liberal democracies are declining in liberalism and idea on the water turnout which is the most uh, authentic uh, institution it says that there is crash in the voting uh, interest in liberal democracies and youths are not voting less than 40 percent of the youths vote in the liberal democracy because liberalism has given them so many opportunities to enjoy life it is necessary to participate in the institution that gives them the freedom. So there is a huge convulsion that is going on in liberal democracy. And Brookings Institution in the study in June 2019 have said that India is the silver lining and golden lining of democracies because as all other nations are fatiguing in democracies, the democratic nations which are supposed to hold the flag of democracy are fatiguing. It is India that is shining as a democracy giving hope. You know, it is in this context we have to now in, see how the Indian democracy is different, where it is rooted, 
and how it is not just a game of numbers and it is something far more it is, it is in a culture affair in india so keeping this gradation of democracies aside we have to look at what is democracy democracy is related closely related to culture. the freedom of annual survey of political rights and liberties 1999-2000 came to a very different view different from what the liberal democracies hold because the freedom house is the mouthpiece of liberalism they said culture and religion are related to democracy and they felt india had indian hinduism has a strong correlation to democracy these are all important factors which have come to light in recent times the democracy is not welded by law or constitution actually it is the constitution that is the output of the way of life of the people as mr jay shankar explained there is a beautiful study the world bank development uh, research and development group in 2017 they made three points about indian democracy which is very very relevant all the religious traditions of india fostered a culture of debate this is important everywhere else the religion of the, the religious tradition has been one of clash war jihad crusade but in india it has been one of debate dialogue this completely avoided bloodshed in india and i will give you the most authentic uh, proof of it professor rj ramal of hawaii university who plays the history of violence and mass killings all over the world for over 30 years he built a beautiful website called power kills in which he said till the 13th century there has been no mass killing in india mass killing in india came to india because of invasion how india avoided mass killings being the largest uh, populated nation in the world with the greatest diversity if you put india on the one side and the rest of the world on the other you will see more diversity in india than the rest of the world put together diversity in languages food everything but still we knew how to live together and in peace and this is because we had fostered a culture of debate and dialogue and this is what amartya sen finally regarded as a argumentative indian the argumentative indian was able to avoid fight through arms and ammunition the second point that uh, the world bank group says is india defies all preconditions for a democracy which the western countries have laid down and yet emerge this democracy as a democracy in its own way in its own uh, traditional way india has sustained a democracy the foundation of which is diversity and tolerance fostered by debate the most important point about today's uh, topic is that we chose the word philosophy and not ideology philosophy means debate ideology means that I am right you are the very fact that india has throughout avoided ideological approach and in its whole wisdom philosophy in here is the reason why india could uh, could uh, manage a huge population free of clashes i get three instances to how india uh, 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 the largest and the most diversified nation in the world what's a democracy this question was put to me in japan in 2017 how india such a diverse country is able to manage democracy i said i will give you three examples as to how india is able to do it you know rama worshiped his father and he was worshiped because he was he was worshiped his father prahlad defied his father and he is worshiped because he defied his father sita obeyed her husband because of that she is respected meera defied her husband because of that she is revered lakshmana obeyed his brother because of that he is respected and vibhishana defied his brother because of that he is respected you know why it is values that decide and there is no role model in india a role model creates dictatorship a role model creates a towering personality which creates dictatorship in india it is ideas it is values it is goals it is something far beyond what we look at life that has guided india and this has avoided conflicts and war 
This is how democracy evolved in India. Absence of monotheism, religious organization, church, state and church conflict. This is absent in India. The entire liberal democracy is a product of conflict. In India, it is a product of conciliation. That is why Professor Huntington said, India, Hinduism is the only religion which fostered a complete separation between state and religion. Nowhere in the world this happened. Everywhere the state was created by religion or the state fostered religion. And that never happened in this country. The broad philosophy was grounded in the conventions established over time. You know, in India, even the anointment of a king needed people's consent. In Ramayana, Dasharatha had to call an assembly of the people which consisted of people of various professions, from barbers to chartered accountants, to ask for their opinion as to Rama is a suitable person. And kings could be removed by council of people, uh, advisors. The method of selection of an emperor if somebody wanted to become an emperor, he cannot conquer. He has to call an assembly of kings and ask them whether you are willing to accept me as the, as the emperor. Chakravarti. The distribution of powers is the most important thing. The land all to the people of India. You know, when the British came here, they wanted to acquire land. But under the traditional laws of India, the land belonged to the people and the king cannot acquire the land. The Privy Council decided that India cannot, that Indians properties cannot be acquired. So they had to pass a land acquisition law. You cannot have democracy without power in the hands of the people. Land was in the hands of the people in India. This is not being properly researched how India sustained a democracy so long. Local bodies controlled the land. Kings had to ask for land for even their purpose. The great Tanjavur temple was built by uh, Raja Raja Choda by asking for land from the village panchayats. The village panchayat had to give land to the king, then only the king could build a temple. This is the tradition of democracy in this country. And we need a more India-oriented research because as the Western liberal democracies are sagging and fatiguing, an alternative civilizational democratic platform has to be prepared. And India is the only country which can offer this combination of a civilizationally driven democracy under modern conditions. I think the ICCR will have to exert in this direction and a project may even have to be instituted as to how India has been able to foster an alignment between electoral democracy and its traditions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gurumuthi. We couldn't expect any less than from you. But thank you very much. It was wonderful. And the whole idea that democracies of the world need to come together because the success of India would be the success of democracy. We are, how do you call it, the, um, the catalyst or the uh, litmus test of whether democracy succeeds in the world or not. People look up to India to see a country with so many diversity, so many challenges. If it can succeed to be a democracy and give the rights to its people, then other countries can do. Look at our size. But also I like your idea about uh, democracy being natural for India. And I've always believed this is true because democracy is actually natural in India because we have so much diversity, so many groups that without democracy, there would be one dominant group over the other. We have managed to actually balance. So our democracy is a democracy of reconciliation, of conciliation and of compromise. So thank you very much. Uh, we would now move to the next speaker. But before that, I would like to say that this marathon described India as a country of a million mutinies. And Amartya Sen said, we are an argumentative lot who debate and discuss all issues. Anybody who has traveled to India knows that debate and discussion are a part of our heritage and that we do not lose an opportunity to discuss anything, anything that is happening not only in India, but across the world. And that is what democracy is all about, about discussing, about debating. And Indians do it all the time in buses, in trains, in benches, in parks, wherever you are, you find Indians debating, discussing, and arguing. But yet, the fights take place in parliament. They don't take place on the streets. When the fights take place in parliament, that's when you know a democracy has matured. People are ready to fight for individual liberty, for their own caste, for their own religion, for the state, and for the country. That is the reason in India, one group can never dominate a narrative. Democracy in India, like, it's like uh, Mr. Gurumurthy said, is a compromise and a collaboration between all the different groups that are there in India. And that's how India functions. 
Our next speaker is a man who knows India very well, a career diplomat from Mongolia. His Excellency Gonching Gambold served in India first from 1988 to 1991, then he served from 1996 to 2000, and then more recently as ambassador from 2015 till some times ago when he went back to Mongolia. He has translated over 2000 books and knows India far better than anybody else I know, including myself. So I'd like to request Mr. Gumboldt to kindly give his address. Mr. Gumboldt. Adarneya Dinay Sakasrabodeji, Adarneya Dinesh Patnaikji, and Satyum. Mujhe bohot prasanta hui ab logon ka aardek pranam karne mein Mongolia se. First of all, I would also like to thank ICCR and its offices for hosting this international important webinar on the auspicious occasion of International Day of Democracy. And I find it very learnful and fortunate for me to take part in this discussion. The relations between my and India are age long. As you know, we are intertwined with history and culture and spiritualism. Right from the beginning of uh, Lord Buddha's teaching prevailed on Mongolian steppe, he got acquainted with India. And Mongolians have high regard to India as a land of Lord Buddha and place of wisdom and new knowledge. Our relations are growing and it can be defined by 3D, democracy, development, and dharma, dharma. So I would uh, like to recall one important event, a landmark event indeed, I would say. It took place on March 23rd, to 2nd April of 1947, which was indeed earlier at the dawn of independence of India, hosted by provincial government of India then, which was left in history in a capital letter as the first Asian relations conference, in which Mongolian delegation also took part, and then Asian uh, countries discussed how to build up their relations in the new area. And that conference, Asian Relations Conference, was also indeed first ever attempt to promote international relations in the, among the Asian countries on the principles of democracy. And the Asian Relations Conference are going to mark its uh, 75th anniversary next year, March. So we should also take note of this historic uh, event. And I hope we can also think over to this event be marked and to renovigrate its momentum. Because that Asian Relations Conference led us to Bandung and Panchila. You know, Panchila is a, the bedrock of our international relations at this contemporary area. And later on, it also <clears throat> involved not only Asians, but also Asian and African countries. And it led to a big and dynamic international event of non aligned movement. So, India's role in this regard is uh, crucial and paramount. Our relations are growing in a defined three Ds, uh, as I said. We have democracy common. We have also very close tie-ups with uh, national legislative assemblies. For instance, last week, speakers of our two parliaments met in Vienna at the margin of the International Speakers Forum. And again, we also are very much grateful to India, Indian parliamentarians who helped us in 
drafting of a democratic constitution of 1992. And uh, then the uh, government of India also nurturing our relations in other fields like uh, political and economic development. Narendra Modi ji visited Mongolia in 2015, during which offered huge uh, amount of line of credit to build up the refinery. Because Mongolia exports crude oil and imports lubricated and petroleum products from other countries. So this refinery is an economic a big project of importance, and we are both sides are exerting efforts to make it another success landmark uh, project in our relations. Again, uh, this development is important, and uh, Dharma and uh, Dharma is also a vital part of our relations. Uh, government of India is under ITEC and under cultural exchange programs offering scholarships and helping us to train and upgrade qualification of our national personals, through which a lot of students also had underwent training under ICCR, and all those who had studied in India also bearing high standards of Indian education and they are remarkable, showing remarkable performances. So India's role, India's democracy, uh, importance of democracy is not only within India or in the subcontinent. It plays important role in the developing countries like Mongolia, and we are very much grateful. Uh, in the course of the last few years, the speakers and parliamentary delegations mutually pay the visit and not only uh, paid visit, but also discussed how to improve our legislative uh, frameworks. And we learned from one another. And uh, he also gives a lot of importance to friendship group within the, uh, each other's parliament. They also playing very helpful role in promoting our cultural exchange, economic relations, and trade and other exchange. So democracy of India, which played important role in our, not only bilateral, but also multilateral level. Mongolia marked recently the 60th year anniversary of its admission to UN. And Indian, uh, Prime Minister Pandi Jawaharlal Nehru strongly supported Mongolia's joining into the UN. And we have been mutually collaborating within the international forums, UN, and other international forums. So, democracy of India not only played and consolidated its national growth, but also it has a dimension of regional and international importance, I would say. So I'm very glad to be in today's webinar and would like to recall again the leaders of our two legislative assemblies and democracy, uh, democratic institutions keep interacting and enriching our relations in the new contents and forms. Soon, we will also have another important event as Indian parliament will reestablish its friendship group with Mongolia, which had been formed in the previous parliament. And Mongolian parliament has also already set up its branch of friendship group as a 15 members and led by dynamic young and uh, woman parliamentarian and we hope the relations between our two legislative organs 
would that play an important role in our bilateral relations? Yes, it had been before. And uh, the other hand, as I said earlier, uh, India's role, India's leadership in a democracy is uh, paying very positive and favorable impact on regional and international arena. So we are very much proud of being close and trusted friends with India. My and uh, forward. Excellency Gambold. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency. Uh, Thank you. Uh, we have uh, come to the end of our first session. Uh, we were, we have normally thought we will take some question answers and there are a few question answers, but because we are running out of time, we will move to the second session in a minute or so. And probably we'll take the questions at the end of it. Uh, thank you everybody for a very inspiring talk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gurumurthy for laying it out and for the rest of the speakers for having contributed in a big way. Uh, we will go to our second session now, which will be chaired by uh, Indrani Bakchi, who is a senior diplomatic editor of the Times of India. Uh, she's a well-known journalist in India who not only writes news stories, opinions, but also has her own blog. Uh, she has a very uh, long career in journalism and still enjoys not only being an editor, but also a reporter in today. Uh, she still has the enthusiasm of a young reporter with the mind of a old editor. So I would be delighted that Indrani Bakchi is today moderating the next session. I will start in one minute. Uh, so please just give us that time to set it up. Thank you very much. Uh, Indrani, whenever you are ready, you can, we can start. Good evening, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, um, welcome to uh, this, uh, the second session of uh, uh, the ICCR event. We have um, uh, this for the second for the second session. We will be talking about uh, democracy in practice. Uh, democracy, it has been said, is a continuous work in progress, and uh, just this week, we can see certainly two um, events in the democratic process playing out in different parts of the world um, with different results, with different processes, and with, uh, uh, with probably different outcomes. Uh, in California and the US, uh, the governor is just um, retained his seat and on Friday we will see the Russians um, voting for or not uh, President Putin in once again uh, in his parliamentary in the parliamentary elections. Uh, now if you look at the reporting on both ends you will see um, how the entire spectrum of democratic process is played out in different parts of the world. Um, in India, we have, uh, I think, except for a brief while, we we have been proud to maintain our democratic processes. Uh, certainly, we've had uh, uninterrupted and freer elections. Uh, we've embraced technology in a way that almost no other democracy has in the, in the world to, to conduct our elections, except Estonia, I think. Estonia has done really well in embracing technology for elections. Um, the importance of elections really cannot be um, underestimated uh, because at its heart, uh, democracy is about the ability, the freedom to choose uh, one's representative, to be able to throw out one's representatives. Um, and that remains at the heart of the democratic process. Um, however, I will not stand between you and uh, our uh, panel of speakers. Um, to begin, may I uh, invite a, a message that has been sent to us by 
President, uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper, the former Prime Minister of Canada, uh, who has sent a video message uh, for this today's event. Um, yeah, we have Mr. Harper's uh, message on screen, please. Excellencies and distinguished guests, thank you to the Indian Council for Cultural Relations for this invitation. And thanks to Minister Amit Shah for his inaugural address. I love India, and I look forward to when we can meet there once again. As India embarks on its 75th year of independence, let me congratulate you on convening this important conversation. Since I left office as Prime Minister, I've continued to make India a priority on my agenda. I do so for a number of reasons. I do so because our two countries, Canada and India, share bonds built over decades of migration and common political heritage. I do so because I marvel at the miracle of Indian democracy, which, despite incredible challenges, has continued to demonstrate its resilience. And I do so as a friend of India, as someone who wishes to see your country succeed in its development for its people and in its status as a confident, rising global power. Let me begin by saying this, light illuminates and shadows define. Amidst the gathering clouds of global turbulence and disruption, India's rise as a self-defined democratic power holds great promise for the world order. Even before the trauma unleashed by the COVID-19 pandemic, globalization and rapid advances in technology have been reshaping our societies. There is more wealth and opportunity than ever before. But there has also been growing agitation from globalization's uneven effects. Disruptions to economic norms and national identities have led to more fragmented and polarized politics, while zero-sum behavior by authoritarian regimes has been weakening the rules-based order. The pandemic has thus strengthened the headwinds that the international order was already struggling to manage. The presumption that a transatlantic consensus would provide a model for governance has been diminished, even in its Western core. Yet these challenges do not undermine the fundamental strengths of the democratic market model, which continues to provide unparalleled prosperity, security, and resilience, where it is being fully embraced and thoughtfully applied. But it does require new champions, and few are as capable or appropriate to occupy this mantle as India. For all its monumental challenges as a nation, its multiple divisions, its colonial past, its socialist legacy, the Republic of India stands as a tribute to the liberating potential of freedom and democracy. Indeed, the coming decades will be shaped in no small part by the choices that India makes as it seeks to rise to its great power potential. This journey is taking place amid a shift in the center of gravity of economic power, from the transatlantic system to the Indo-Pacific region. India's rise is also occurring against the backdrop of a contest for global supremacy between China and the United States, along with the increasing decoupling of their economic models. Most emerging economies are seeking to prioritize their own development, and to avoid the fallout of the strategic competition. But a real choice is being thrust upon all of them. Free markets governed by the rule of law and democratic norms versus a state-directed neo-mercantilist model of trade, investment, and debt. Countries will invariably gravitate toward a rules-based world of free nations or a hub-and-spokes global order with an authoritarian power at its center. India did not need to face aggression across its borders to understand on which side of these choices it should fall. India is, by your very nature, a deeply pluralistic society that will naturally resist any inclination to authoritarian governance. India is also an inherently entrepreneurial nation that has thrived when presented with the opportunities that democratic capitalism affords. Thus, as India continues to emerge from its non-aligned legacy 
and becomes a consequential leader in the international arena, its success will rest on the democratic model at home and appropriate partnerships abroad. The bold policy directions of the Modi government, quality for aspiring Indian citizens, fundamental rights to Kashmiris, deep economic and agricultural reforms are to be admired and encouraged. Together, they indicate a clear understanding of India's needs, its potential, and its growing importance in the world. And with India's steadfast leadership with its Quad partners in America, Japan, and Australia, the region's major democracies are engaging in the kind of democratic alliance building the world needs more of. My friends, let me conclude with this. India has already achieved much. Your 3,000-year-old civilization has had incredible cultural impacts on all of humanity. And modern India has put a lie to the notion that democratic governance and economic progress are somehow incompatible with extreme social diversity and high initial levels of poverty. Since independence, India has left the famines of the past behind. Since the 1990s, India has undertaken an economic transformation that is destined to achieve great heights. And now should India continue to make the right choices, you will discover your potential to lead the world as a whole to greater prosperity and peace. In this task, in this journey, I stand with you. I wish you well, and I thank you again for your invitation today. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Uh, we've had the pleasure of Mr. Harper's uh, presence and his wisdom in numerous Raisana dialogues that have been organized here over the past few years. Uh, may I now call on Mr. E Eric Solheim uh, from Norway, who has, is also no stranger to India and also no stranger to efforts to bring democratic processes, democratic norms, and democratic philosophies to this part of the world. And his work in Sri Lanka, of course, cannot be forgotten. Mr. Solan, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Indrani. And let me tell you first, it's such a privilege for me as a long-time friend of India to be able to speak at such a prestigious institution with so many great Indians, but of course, so many foreign friends of India. Let's at the beginning face it, right on. If in 1947, when India was constituted as a free nation again, if anyone has said that 75 years later, that the vast majority of people in the world living in a democracy would be in India, or that the world would feel that democracy is much more secure in India than it is in the United States of America, where one of the two major parties are attacking the democracy by the day by all great Indian parties are supporting democracy. If anyone has made these uh, predictions, uh, there would have been extremely high odds. Most experts in 1947, at least outside India, would say India is too poor, too diverse. It has no tradition for democracy. All these falsehoods which India has proven wrong in these great 75 years of history. I will point to three underlying ideas, which I believe is at the core of Indian democracy, because democracy is not about the exact structures or the technicalities. Why? Of course, it's a fantastic uh, achievement to be able to bring ballot papers every five years, or even more often, up to the mountains of the Himalayas, into the deserts of Rajasthan, or to all these outlying islands. India is so diverse. It's such a brilliant, but it's about uh, underlying ideas. First, what Mr. Gurumurti also said, it's about peace. Peace is the foundation for democracy. While there's always sufficient violence in India uh, to give that deed to the world that India is a violent place, you need to, comp you need to compare uh, to Europe, to Africa, to China, to the Middle East. This has been 75 years of amazing peace in India, very limited violence. Yes, there have been two or three uh, incidents of, of separation in Nagaland, in Punjab, uh, in Kashmir, 
but overall India has kept together and it has been at peace and violence has been very, very, very low in India compared to any other place. That's of course a foundation stone uh, for democracy. Violence is the biggest threat to democracy everywhere. And this is secondly, even more uh, incredible or even more successful when you compare to the variety of India, diversity of India. I very often say that, look, there are more Muslims in India than in any other nation except Indonesia. There are more Christians in India than in all the Nordic nations of Europe together. There are more Sikhs in India than there are Jews in the entire world. You have a huge number of other religions like Jainism. And on top of all, you have one billion Hindus. So to keep peace and tolerance in this diversity is a remarkable feat. And remind yourself that Christianity came to India thousands of years before it came to my nation, Norway. Uh, uh, and all the other religions have been there since time uh, immoral. Uh, Hinduism has one, I think, very important facet which underlies the success. It may be the most tolerant of all global religions. While we Christians have fought each other, have completely ridiculous issues with no bearing for people like the nature of Christ. Is Christ God or is he a human being or something in between? You have nothing of that in Hinduism. Gandhiji said that you can be an atheist and Hindu at the same time. It's a religion which can embrace, which is tolerant, and where you can bring your own ideas into this. There is an old saying from the old texts of Hinduism, which is one of the most beautiful I know of. It says that how was heaven and earth created? Uh, only the number one God, only the highest God knows, or maybe doesn't know. And this uh, readiness to, to embrace humbleness uh, and embrace variety and embrace skepticism and questions is at the core of Hinduism. And in that sense, Hinduism may be the best suited religious idea for the 21st century, while of course it have to live uh, with others. The most important debate in India today, in my view, of course, is the debate between Hinduata people and secularists by BJP and the different Hinduata organizations on one side and the Congress party and left-wing organizations on the other side. Uh, and from what I can see, they're both right. For sure, Hinduism and the Hindu texts are at the core of Indian tradition through thousands of years. On the other also true, and there's a variety of religions and need to respect every single religion. So as a foreigner, what I really hope to see in the years to come is some common ground to be found in this debate, which will have to be to recognize the enormous importance of Hinduism to India, and Hindu texts and Hindu ideas and culture and traditions to India, while at the same time, of course, respect the openness coming from secularism uh, in uh, India. And if that happens, uh, this debate will end up as with strength rather than with the uh, possibility of, of being um, uh, dividing. And thirdly, and, I mean, peace, tolerance, and the third is the idea of federalism. Uh, as Indrani said, I was the chief negotiator in the peace process in Sri Lanka. The conflict in Sri Lanka started when some people said we should have one language in this nation. One language, as others said, but one language means two nations. Because if Singala language is the only nation in Sri Lanka, where is the room for Tamils? Tamils will never accept that Tamil, this rich, one of the richest languages in the entire world, one of the oldest and most uh, sophisticated languages in the world, how many Tamils will accept that as a secondary nation in their own, uh, in their own land? India had embraced a similar idea, one language, say Hindi for everyone, well, India would have been 20 nations by today. So the ability of India to be a federal state is absolutely at the core of India's diversity and democracy. And it sets an example to others. I told, always told my Sri Lankan friends, well, if federalism can work in such a diverse place as India, how cannot 
federalism work in a much smaller land of Sri Lanka. And this is related to the idea of overlapping identities. Because if you ask an Indian, what was your identity? Say a Tamil, a Hindu, uh, an Indian from Tamil Nadu. If you ask that person, are you a Tamil, are you a Hindu, are you Indian? You will normally always say, thank you, I'm all. Uh, I don't want to distinguish because I can have more identities at the same time. And that's, of course, a, such a strength. And what other nations where you try to force a very narrow, just one language or one religion or one, uh, one uh, identity uh, are str struggling, struggling with. So this, in my view, are the underpinning ideas of Indian democracy, peace, tolerance and diversity, and federalism. Finally, the future of democracy. Because as many as pointed to, I mean, non-democratic society has also been immensely successful. I'm never in the business of speaking down what China has achieved. It's absolutely remarkable to bring 1.4 billion people out of poverty and establish education, health, infrastructure for them all. Let's never speak down that. But if democracy is to survive and to be strong in the years to come, it must be based on debate, but debate must also lead to unity because every nation needs unity. You also need competition, but you also need delivery. Democracy need to see the challenge to deliver. We must deliver unity in every nation, and we must deliver, of course, education, health, infrastructure, exactly what people desire all over the world. The desires of people, whether it's in the United States, Europe, China, Europe, uh, India, uh, Africa, is basically the same. A safe life where I can progress and use my abilities, but where I can have health if I get sick and education for my children. Finally, when India was established in 1947, it was at the most difficult of backgrounds. Colonialism, as some of my British friends sometimes say, colonialism was a good thing. We brought Railroads to India. <laughs> what a joke. Do you, really, do you need to go through the pain of colonialism to get railroads? When India was colonialized, about 30% of the GDP of the world was in India. When India came out to colonialism, maybe 2% of the global GDP was in India, and about 15% of the people of India could read and write. Independent India has been so much more successful than colonialism. It's an enormous road to a bet better future. And I will quote at the end Foreign Minister Jai Shankar, who said that what India, the strong, vibrant India, which should be one of the biggest economies, maybe the second biggest economy in the world in the, in the next, next few years, that India will be more Indian, not Western. It will be modernized, but it will be modernized on the basis of Indian history and tradition and the enormous achievement of independent India. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Solang. Um, you have reminded all of us of some of the more important tenets of democracy. Um, and the, the debate, as you have rightly said, is not just between dem democratic uh, societies and authoritarian societies. It is also between societies that deliver and societies that don't. And we, uh, as Democrats and as uh, members of the world's largest democracy, we must keep this very uh, much front and center. Uh, but one, do not use uh, democracy as an excuse for non-delivery. Um, and on that note, uh, may I invite Professor Werner Metsky from uh, SOAS, uh, Professor Emeritus of South Asian Laws at SOAS in the University of London. Uh, Professor Metsky, the floor is yours. Well, uh, I don't know if I can be heard. Yes, uh, you can. Because I can't be seen uh, as yes, far as yes. I know. Oh, you namaskar, can't, everyone. You can't be seen, but you <laughs> yeah, can because, be heard, yes. Because I'm a technophobe and a little illiterate, and I'm, 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 I've been left alone here. Too. Namaskar, everyone, and thank you so much for arranging this wonderful conference. I really think this is a great achievement, very important as a topic, obviously. So, but I'll carry on straight away so that we don't lose time. Um, 
Indian democracy in practice offers, as we saw today, a series of lessons in how to manage super diversity in every respect. It is indeed something to celebrate with pride. As panel one identified, Indian democracy undoubtedly has ancient traditions that go back a long, long time. Nobody can deny that there was an ancient latent consciousness a legal consciousness, as we lawyers talk about this, that the people of ancient India, even then, in all their diversity and different strands, were directly and impliedly involved in such democratic processes and traditions as important stakeholders. Yes, there was all along, however, rather much emphasis on kings and ruler figures. Uh, enlarged, by a largely traditional historical focus on such lead characters, which then tend to be male, of course, everywhere in the world. In Sanskrit, the root Raj signifies to govern, but also to shine and be radiant. So to be a model in so many ways. Derived from that root, we have terms like Rajya and Raja, of course, but there's also the concept of Kshatra, power or might, and hence the obligation to use that power wisely, not like an absolutist Western style rule. In addition, and very highly significant, there is the root ni, to lead, to guide, but also to govern, which then gave rise to core concepts like niti, leadership, and of course, neta, the figure of the leader. And as we heard already, elections are today at the center of attention. So in fact, there has been a factual shift also in this scenario of much more emphasis on the role of the people in democracy away from these leader figures. If in global legal language, dominated by English, of course, we now have much focus on government and governance, and discuss various forms of rule of law, we should not forget or ignore that ancient Indic traditions offered its own rich sources of such coexisting conceptual elements. These still underpin the current manifestations and experience of Indian democracy in practice, also in elections, as I just said. Indian democracy is in practice, as well as theory, therefore not a copy of some Western model. It is a unique, culture-specific, and highly plural phenomenon. I have described Indian studies generally as a palace with many rooms interconnected with numerous doors that make for all sorts of interpolations and intersectionalities. The vast halls in that ancient structure dedicated to governance, ruling, and leading have resulted over time in a set of identity postulates, as the Japanese social legal scholar Masari Chiba called this, a set of values and basic principles that underpin also today what one can see as Indian legal consciousness with this element of you know, the uh, argumentative Indian and, and all these kinds of things that we already discussed. So yes, we can study the Indian constitution as an English document and as the cornerstone of the nation, as Professor Glanville Williams famously called it. But there is something far less visible, but even more powerful underpinning this massive constitution and its basic structures that no human authority, it seems, may change completely to grasp power in the forms that will abuse the basic principles of Indian democracy. This indicates also that something else than state law, you know, I'm a legal scholar, but I'm not only concerned about state law, that something else than state law, and yet a form of law, is in operation. If we focus on democracy, we recognize the voice and the power of the people. That's not primarily state law. The Indian constitution is clearly a people's constitution, as an excellent new study by the historian Lloyd Day at Princeton, authoritatively confirmed in 2018. 
My own work over decades has shown how the various people of India remain deeply involved in shaping democracy in practice. This happens not the least through operating India's massively important personal law system. This is where people are directly, most directly involved in shaping the law around them as it affects them. This domain of Indian law causes much headache for many outside observers who want to see the personal laws replaced by a uniform civil code of some case, of some kind. In my view, this is a terribly bad and actually undemocratic step. The continued presence and strength of Indian personal laws, which coexist, we must not forget, with a powerful general law system, also applying to family law, illustrate that no amount of attempted state control can fully subjugate the people and their considerable energy for developing appropriate patterns of regulating their own daily lives. But of course, people have to do this responsibly, and that is not easy. That is everywhere a huge challenge. To remind people of this requirement is the key task of the courts and the intricate application of India's democratic constitution, which in itself provides most answers, but of course not all the practical remedies. Ideally, the numerous disputes that will inevitably arise when masses of people live together and struggle to manage their day-to-day -day relations should be resolved internally and locally if only to save costs, also for the state. But beyond the personal law sphere, another core component of Indian democracy is deeply embedded in the country's legal consciousness. But this is often dismissed and more often ignored and even feared by its association with religion. What I call the natural law component of Indian laws, a sense of everything being diversely connected allows the various legal orders that coexist within Indian democracy to be brought and kept under the umbrella of the Indian constitutional framework that is being operated in practice. Many modern secular scholars seem to have problems with acknowledging this factor, but it cannot be dismissed on account of some ideology or modernist bias. We realize this today, actually, in the latest debates on comparative constitutional law and the handling of environmental law as a massive challenge and the troubles the scene that we now live. Indian law as a conceptual domain seems far ahead of other legal orders in remembering um, that if we are ultimately all connected, we may still all be different, but we are also part of the same and thus partly just, and, and thus partly equal. This tension has, of course, inspired India's mind-boggling experiments with affirmative action, which have caused uh, rightly a lot of global attention and they are clearly related to the delivery of democracy. These show the basically competing perspectives at work, requiring constant subtle balancing on a day-to-day -day basis. Indian democracy in practice is precisely such a highly complex phenomenon. It does well to have a unique constitution that is full of internal contradictions, and thus operates a legal order that must, of necessity, continue to debate the scope for appropriate solutions. It is a living document, not something set in stone. The solutions found need to be often local and situation-specific, and thus should be sorted out by the people themselves in some kind of self-controlled ordering process, not running to the state for every little problem. You see, I had to run to my wife to get uh, connected and be visible. However, this leaves, of course, also what scholars have been calling bottlenecks of justice and abuses of the legal order. Yet, notably, 
Indian law as a whole is prepared for such challenges and seems to have maintained solid methods and processes of addressing such bottlenecks. One example that kept me very busy over the years has been the Indian way of managing and operating public interest litigation, which Professor Upendra Bakshi calls social action litigation. In my view, this public interest dimension in Indian law also implicitly includes what I mentioned, the natural law component that uh, plays such a big role in people's uh, legal consciousness. And that is the people as subjects, but also the people as rulers. And so here we see the interplay of rights and duties again. I was privileged to learn from legendary judges, such as V. R. Krishna Iyer, who described in his own time what made him himself very personally became an activist, become an activist judge, concerned to ensure that India's democracy remained vibrant and people-centric. There is much criticism of Indian democracy in practice all over the world, but I feel it is often rather ignorant of the full picture that uh, one gets if one studies this properly. India, in my view, does well to seek to find its own way as simply copying templates from outside was never going to work anyway. It is not going to work, as we see in many other countries, of course, uh, all around the world as well. Now, as Professor Guru Murthy already suggested, there may well be a wonderful research task here for the ICCR to explore this uh, sort of uh, autochthonous, indigenous, yeah. Uh, element of the Indian legal order in its own right. And I would like to thank you for incorporating me into this conference uh, and stop here. Namaskar. Thank you, Professor Wensky. Um, may I now call upon uh, our last speaker for the day, um, Dr. Swapan Das Gupta, um, member of the Rajya Sabha. Uh, Dr. Das Gupta, the floor is yours. You need to unmute. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Indrani. Uh, first, let me apologize for being uh, fashionably or rather unfashionably late for joining in. But it, it, it had everything to do with the travails of Indian democracy. You know, one of the things India does rather well is we have a plethora of elections. And every election leads to more and more controversies. And I was just spending the past uh, one hour petitioning the election commission about some rather abstruse local dispute which has taken place. But that's really the stuff of democracy. The fact that we get so agitated, excited, incensed over local issues, Sometimes we get equally agitated and incensed about national and occasionally, if you're that way inclined, international issues also intrude onto our consciousness. But principally, I would say that Professor Sen's description of India being a rather argumentative society you know, it was ironic that the word argumentative, which actually has a slightly pejorative context in the English language, was taken to me as something rather flattering in India. There's a difference between, uh, in, in Bengal, when people say argumentative, they often mean equally litigious. And I think Professor Winsky might understand that Indians are also equally litigious when it comes to handling disputes. Democracy has come in somewhere in between to actually reconcile various contradictions and find ways in to go, go forward. When India became a functioning democracy, 
with the election of 1951, I always state that to be the defining point. There was a great deal of skepticism about how well and how effective this would be. I think it would be fair to say that if nothing else, the sheer turnout, the statistics of the turnout of the elections from every general election to general election will testify to one thing, that the sense of participation and the sense of involvement has been deepening with every decade. And that while Indian politics, Indian public life can give the appearance of being rather fractious, it also en has enhanced the sense of involvement of people. And whereas in the West, for instance, I've often seen statistics which would suggest that the element of turnout is often dependent on your social status. The poor vote less, the better off vote more. In India, it's quite the opposite. The poor actually vote quite resoundingly. The better off, their turnout is, is often rather indifferent. The people who complain the most in South Mumbai or South Delhi are probably the ones whose turnout is the least in any election. And their sense of participation, they, they might have a greater sense of involvement, but their sense of participation in the democratic exercise turns out to be rather less. The second feature which I would say <laughs> is worth commenting about in the Indian context as we move to about 75 years of a functioning democracy is that the social basis of political leadership has enlarged quite exponentially. If you look back at the leadership of the nationalist movement in the 1940s and 30s or even earlier, and compare it with the social groupings which are now most active in politics and are taking decisions sometimes, not very good decisions, sometimes pretty good decisions. If you just compare the two, you'll find that the social groupings, that, that there have been a considerable social enlargement of the terrain of politics. People like me, who might be considered slightly uh, Anglophile, Anglophone in their orientation, uh, with a sort of presidency background uh, of stemming from Bengal, we might feel ourselves a little marginalized from this process. Just as in 1921, the emergence of Gandhi led to the three Bombay, Madras, and Bengal presidencies feeling a bit left out of the whole process. Similarly, you're seeing that in terms of social groupings, you're seeing far more greater involvement of people who had hitherto not even registered on the radar of, of political involvement. I believe some people say it's a greater degree of social fragmentation of India. I see it more as a sense of greater involvement. It depends. I mean, there, there are, it's, it's not necessarily that this always has a positive dimension. There can be a few negative facets about it, but there is no question about it that the social basis of Indian democracy has enlarged quite a lot. The third point, which I think <coughs> which, which is, is worth talking about in, in this sense, is that, which is, I think, something which Professor Mensky mentioned briefly, is the increasing tendency of other institutions, whether it's the media, whether it's the judiciary, or anything else, to become active players in the process. Now, the politicization of the judiciary, which uh, 
Professor Mensky thought was actually not a very bad thing. And they, I think tacitly he approved of the PIL, of, of the judges ruling India by proxy. I, don't, I can't say whether it's a, it's a positive thing or not, but what it has done is that it certainly has enlarged the boundaries of Indian democracy to take into account other features which were not there in the past. Now, how this will evolve in the coming days is something we need to be quite alert and vigilant about in the future. I think there are dangers of India being governed by, by the judges. They are unelected after all. There's an unelected uh, judicial college which can, which is also self-perpetuating in some ways, whether they can actually call the final shots, whether they can have a veto over the executive, something we need to consider in the past. But that it imposes a certain check on executive excess is undeniable. So that feature of Indian democracy is there. And finally, let me come to this point about uniformity. Now, it used to be said that for everything which is true about India, the opposite is equally true. And I think that's a fact in every feature we find, in, in every step of the way. There is no question that as far as cultural fact practices are concerned, food habits are concerned, linguistic and other features are concerned, the diversity of India is permanent. But then comes the larger question about political systems. To what extent do political feature systems have to have a measure of uniformity? For the first time in India, we've got now a reasonably uniform tax structure, a one market principle. What has been the aspiration of the European Union was sought to be brought into India in the form of GST. That has its positives, and also that involved a wonderful method of revenue sharing, which involved also a degree of each the center as well as the states giving up part of their sovereignty and pooling it together. A voluntary exercise of hideous complexity, which was managed reasonably smoothly. So what Bismarck may have done in the 1870s in, in the context of Germany, or what Europe managed to do with the uh, in, in the 1950s and subsequently, was also achieved as far as economics was concerned in India, in terms of the tax structure. It's still in a tentative, it's, it's still in its early stages. But whether this should be accompanied by other forms of uniformity is a debate which has taken place. Now, we know the debate which has taken place about Article 370, a very passionate debate which took place. I personally was all in favor of the abrogation of the Article 370, partly because I felt that it imposed a certain form of emotional balkanization to India. And therefore, there has to be an uniformity. But within that uniformity, there is enough scope for having local localized identities which take which are there. I think that balance must be struck. The question of a uniform civil code has also been brought up. Uniform civil, the idea of a uniform civil code was written into the directive principles of the constitution. But like many features of the directive principle uh, uh, of the directive principles, there's been rather modest progress, if if, uh, if at all, on this question. The issue really boils down is not uh, is that not that we want to get rid of Sharia law, we want to get rid of the laws of Manu, or we want to get rid of some other uh, esoteric varieties of customary law, which may exist in parts of North India, Northeastern India, 
It's not the issue of that. The real challenge which comes up in the thing is, has there been a draft of a uniform civil code? I'm yet waiting to this day to see if that uniformity, there is always the case that there is a basis for gender equity which takes place in all the, the different civil codes. But we haven't as yet moved to the stage where we have been able to draft a single, a model or draft uniform civil code, which we can present to the people and say, look, this is it. This will ensure that your traditions are protected, that no one's traditions are going to be recklessly violated, that there is a happy blend of tradition and keeping in mind the modern practices, the morality of the 21st century. That blend is something which we look for. But the important point here is that in these debates, in these multiple debates which are taking place all over India, and in which people have different positions, what we find is that what we take in as granted is the fact that we take our democracy as granted. We don't have to look over our shoulder to see, will this debate continue in a few years' time? Yes, the debate might take a different form altogether. It might be fine-tuned in some way. But the essence of the debate, the rumbustuous character of the debate, sometimes the anarchic content of that debate, I would even go in to say, will be something which will remain with us. And I think that's the excitement of India. And the, the challenge before us is in how do we use this form of creativity, this form of intellectual creativity, and blend it towards a modern form of economic advance so that India can actually, so, so, so that these accusations you know, the space for dissent has truncated. I've never been able to understand where this argument has actually come from. Because I think those who say the space has been truncated are the ones who've been shouting the loudest in, in, in some senses. And some of us who were on the uh, majority side of electoral politics often found ourselves in a woeful minority when it came to the intellectual climate. So the tables often got turned in different ways. Uh, to be, I must say, to be a political Hindu in India at one time was recklessly unfashionable. And uh, it meant being slightly marginalized from the intellectual discourse, which whose terms again were set by the West. But that's life. That's reality. And that's, I think, is something which in India we can accept and we can uh, we can internalize in, in, in different ways. And look forward to a time when all forms of discourse can have their place under the sun and nothing can really be edged out as it is. There's a great churning which is taking place in India. That churning is an intellectual churning. That churning is an economic churning. It's a social churning. And it's being facilitated by the larger structure of democracy which we have created in India, and who's at, and our attempt in the coming days is really, how do we improve it? Nothing is perfect. And this democracy, which we celebrated 75 years, is something I think we can take back with a measure of pride and say, it may not be perfect, but it's damn good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Swapan. Um, we have... Uh, one question on our uh, chat box, which I think I will read out, and or maybe you can all read it. But I think uh, Swapan, you might want to answer that question because it is very uh, India and Indian Parliament and democratic democracy specific. <laughs> Would you like me to read it out, or yeah, please, please. Yes. Uh, so this is from John Chapel. And uh, he says that the way in which democracy is practiced in current India, is it getting better or is it facing more challenges now? 
uh, democracy will not sustain without its institutions like parliaments, courts, electoral system, etc. Are they all functioning as expected in India? Well, I think here is the paradoxical uh, thing. There are certain institutions which are perfect, uh, functioning wonderfully, smashing leaves. We are getting better and better in doing elections. The malpractices are getting wiped out, eliminated, etc. So it's a fairer election. Participation is greater. More, uh, uh, maybe it's a little more expensive than it was, but participation is greater. But what happens? You you elect legislatures, take them into the legislature, and there you have this bizarre situation. Is the quality of parliament? Is the quality of the state legislature? Is that improving? The answer is a resounding no. The quality of parliament has, in my view, deteriorated quite substantially, partly because I think there's been a confusion about what is the role of the MP. Is he a cooperator? Is he a local legislature? Is he, is, is he supposed to be the Mr. Fixer for all occasions? It's not quite clear. Again, there has been a greater dependence on the executive to be the great, uh, to resolve, to manage crises, to fix things. That's where the whole thing is. The expectation is coming. And then finally, you have a certain degree of expectation on the judiciary. Then, yes, the judiciary will be the, the people of last recourse. That the judges can actually sort out. They'll be the ultimate, uh, the dispenser of justice. Despite all that. So, you have expectation, but what is the quality of the judicial administration? That leaves a lot to be desired. So you have the paradoxical situation, elections improving, quality of the <clears throat> quality of participation being enhanced, quality of representation and quality in, in, the, in, in parliament taking a bit of a nosedive, expectation among the, on, on the judiciary rising, but the judicial administration, the judicial system being clogged at a very various point. So that's the paradox of India. So I don't think there's a straightforward answer to that. But I think it's important to recognize all these challenges, recognize all these obstacles which are there, and move ahead hesitantly, sometimes in a blundering sort of way. But I think we blundered quite well in post I am uh, in Rani. I think you you should allow the others, your video. Uh, other uh, uh, other speakers to have their say also on this theme. It's not merely on you, India. You may you may well you may well do that. Uh, absolutely, uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, everybody else, and I just wanted to add a question that is directed to Mr. Solheim, uh, which is on uh, democracy. As the deliverer of growth, and this goes goes to what you have referred to in your uh, in your remarks. Uh, if you could also um, uh, give your thoughts on uh, how when you when when the debate happens between uh, authoritarian systems being more able to deliver uh, as opposed to democracies, something we hear from China all the time. Um, what is it? Uh, how do you look at democracy as being a deliverer of both governance and growth? And if you would like to chip in uh, as well to the question that Fopin just answered. This is, of course, a very important question which people are struggling with uh, all over the world. I mean, some of the most brilliantly developing countries in the world has been autocratic. There's no doubt about that. Think of South Korea, which was purer than Madagascar, Africa in the 1950s, is now one of the most developed and most democratic states in the world. Think of Singapore, which is a shining example for development, even a very green, environment-friendly, people-friendly city. And of course, China in, 19, in 1970s was purer than Africa. At the time, China was ranked number 177 nation in the world when it came to uh, economy per capita. Now, because many provinces in China is as rich as Europe, and there is an unprecedented development in China. More people have been brought out of poverty uh, in a shorter period of time than any other place. 
what is the strength of autocratic systems? Uh, I think the strength is that when you have good leadership, as South Korea had for very long and still have, as uh, uh, Singapore had under Lee Kuan Yew, and China has basically had since 1980, uh, then auto autocratic systems may make them uh, work well because they, you have uh, a common desire, you can get systems which work and you can get rapid economic growth and delivery for, for people. However, the great weakness of an autocratic system is when you don't get good leaders or when leaders cling uh, to power uh, for very long in democratic systems, we can get rid of leaders if Prime Minister Modi doesn't behave well, for sure at some point in the uh, voters will kick him out as they kicked out the Congress party in the past and this, this will happen again. And China, when they had uh, very, very poor leaders like the Gang of Four uh, in the early, early decades, they performed extremely poorly, very, very bad. If you look to Africa, the same, some autocratic systems with good leaders work very well, some autocratic systems with bad leaders work very, very poorly. How, overall, of course, most people in the world, the vast majority, want the democratic systems, for sure. Uh, I think the debate in principle is one. I mean, everyone wants a democratic system. So our challenge to support democracy is to make it work. It must deliver. It must deliver peace and unity in every nation, and it must deliver uh, economic, social developments. Otherwise, people will turn, uh, turn away. Uh, do does Indian democracy work? I think from any global perspective, it works very well. Think of the fact that there is hardly any dispute on electoral results. If you when you have counted the votes in West Bengal, I think Mr. Dasgupta did run in West Bengal quite recently. When the vote was quoted, the BJP didn't say uh, no. This was this was some kind of fake news. This was some kind of uh, cheating with the result. BJP accepted the results and went on to win the next election. Uh, looks to the United States of America, how every election there is now disputed. And that those who lose don't accept uh, being the losers. And that's so the case in many other places in the world. And the electoral system of India has never been corrupted. No one thinks the electoral commission is under the, uh, under the, the tumble of the BJP or Congress or anyone else. It's working very well. So overall, while for sure there are many challenges, I think today in the democracy has stood the test for 75 years and it's one of the strongest democracies on planet Earth. But correct me, if, Mr. Dasgupta, if I'm wrong. No, absolutely, you're right. And I think that's quite true. There is, uh, I think our electoral system is getting better and better with every year. I think that's one thing we can claim. I wish I could say the same thing for once they get elected and go to parliament. Is the quality of parliament increasing, getting better every time? That's, I think, a challenge we have to address. Indeed. Um, Fetsuwenski, would you like to uh, uh, jump in to the question that uh, Swapan addressed? And uh, um, maybe take it a little further on the on the justice quotient uh, over to you okay uh, let me try am i audible yes uh, it, it looks like um, two things uh, one is um, i i fully agree that uh, india appears to be really successful in its um, perennial constant struggle to fine tune the system uh, I'm quite intrigued by this observation from uh, the gentleman from Bengal that, you know, you feel that uh, the parliamentarians are not of the right quality. Maybe there is an issue here over identity. I mean, if you are seeing yourself uh, as a parliamentarian, are you a member of the state now or are you actually still a member of society? There is. Uh, you know, a, a, an identity struggle within the minds of these people. And so this is one of the, the bottlenecks of trouble in, in a de democratic arrangement where, of course, democracy means that you want uh, progress and good things for everyone, not just for yourself. 
Yeah. So uh, this person that gets elected from a particular locality, uh, yes, has an obligation specific to the people of this locality, but it also the same person has an obligation to uh, the wider nation. It has an obligation to the constitution. It has an obligation, as I explained, to the entire universe in a way of getting this holistic system uh, into the right shape. Uh, and this is a struggle that I think many um, individuals um, fight with. Um, I happen to teach, uh, or used to teach leadership programs. So that's where this came up as a big issue, quite clearly. Now, regarding the judiciary, I don't actually quite agree that um, there is a risk of uh, judicial uh, power taking over and overpowering uh, democracy, but they have clearly very, very strongly intervened at various points to uh, remind the nation uh, of certain things not going right. And one saw this very clearly in public interest litigation cases, you know, where uh, the Supreme Court invites uh, people to send a postcard from jail, basically, if you find that you are uh, finding your basic uh, human rights violated. Uh, these are necessary elements of judicial intervention. They, they can't be dismissed as some uh, evidence of uh, juristocracy or whatever people want to call it these days. Uh, and I think we should also have some pity with these judges because they get cases thrown on their desks all the time and then they they cannot say look i don't know or i don't want to answer they may say that they they may we have this quite often that indian judges in reported cases say what is this you know another case on this problem we have already dealt with this twenty thousand times there was a case where it's where it started the, the case report started dowry dowry and dowry you know we have enough of this yeah can this please stop so my point here is that the judiciary as an active participant in this democratic process is under enormous pressure to deliver. Uh, and often they can't actually deliver because uh, they, they cannot uh, find an adequate solution uh, to a particular problem, which is long term, maybe like the dowry issue and things like that. You can't overnight uh, abolish things in a, a single judgment. Yeah? These are processes that take time. The judicial involvement in these processes in India has been truly remarkable. I think it is a great, great achievement. Let me stop it. So thank you very much, uh, all of you. And I'd like to now turn you over to uh, Dinesh Patnaik, the DGICCR. Um, thank you, Indrani, ma'am. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Dinesh Patnaik sir had to leave for another engagement. So uh, I will just uh, give the vote of thanks uh, on behalf of ICCR. Um, so uh, it has been a very interesting session today uh, in this uh, uh, conference, both in both the panels, panel one and panel two. Uh, it would be a very complex task for me to um, summarize uh, today's proceedings, but we saw today how uh, uh, how many how the eminent speakers um, and and uh, personalities uh, touched the various aspects of uh, democracy at 75 for India. How democracy is the national philosophy of India. There was a mention of uh, civilizational driven democracy. Uh, how um, democracy has been practiced in one way or the other. Uh, from ancient times uh, till uh, today in modern India, uh, how the modern Indian democracy has uh, features which um, is the envy of the world, whether it's uh, the unity in diversity, uh, the federalism, the structure we have, the multi-party system, the, the ethos of tolerance, uh, the, the vibrancy of debates, etc., etc. So. Uh, we have many democratic assets uh, which have given the sustainability of our democratic structure. 
uh, across uh, the world of course uh, india has been a leader in what is being increasingly uh, described as development democracy and how india can provide leadership or india has been providing leadership and can provide leadership uh, to countries uh, uh, in in the committee of nations and how our democratic credentials are seen as a gold standard all in all um there was a very um uh, uh a very uh, wide and varied uh uh expression of opinions about uh how uh, india's culture of democracy has been and there was also a peek into the future how we how there are various shades and colors of indian democracy and how uh the the the, the two panels how they were themed whether it's uh uh, the philosophy of democracy and the practice of democracy how they were covered in such a uh, nice fashion by all our eminent speakers from across the world so um i would just like to take this opportunity uh, on behalf of iccr uh, our president and uh, director general uh, to thank uh, firstly our honorable external affairs minister who gave the inaugural uh, message uh, which underlined the theme of the conference uh set the tone for it and then i would like to thank our moderators uh director general uh, mr patnaik and uh, indrani ma'am uh for the second panel and all our distinguished panelists uh, uh from uh, i would uh, especially thank uh mr julian leeser from australia professor igosa usagi from nigeria uh shri swaminathan gurumurthy swaminathan gurumurthy from india uh ambassador ganbol from mongolia uh mr stephen stephen harper from canada mr eric solheim from norway uh shri sapan das gupta from india and professor menski from uk you have all uh, made today's conference uh very enriching and very memorable and i think it was a fitting uh, event to celebrate uh the international day of democracy so on behalf of iccr i thank you once again all for being part of this event and uh, wish you a good day or good night as the case may be thank you